Well, Pascal, film marketing, and this week we are going to look at a film which was released back in August 1987. And funnily enough, we were reminded about this film by our interview with my sister Kate on episode 100. We were talking about all the many films that we've loved over the years, and this one was mentioned and you and I almost sort of instantaneously thought that has to be doesn't it? it has to be in film marketing we are going to talk about no way out let's check out the trailer they needed a hero I understand he has a background in intelligence there's two tours of naval intelligence get him here he liked excitement take us somewhere he wanted her their passion upset the balance of power. What's all this top secret business I've been hearing about over the Pentagon? You know I work for Bryce? Then that makes two of us. This one can do things for me like no other woman I've ever met. Behind the cover-up. Try and understand. The power. The important thing is to abort an investigation before it ever gets to you. You haven't told me everything. Who's running this thing in the Pentagon? The new boy, Farrell. So he can take the fall in case anything goes wrong. The loyalty. I love you. I promise I'll work everything out. How did you actually meet the Secretary of Defense? I need a car. It's an emergency. These people have already tried to kill one person who knew. Bring that hey, one down. No, 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 you can't take that. Behind the deceit. If it were your intention to bring down David Bryce, then I'd have no choice but to make sure that you didn't get away with it. They mean to kill me, Sam. Because of the truth, there's no way out. Kevin Costner, Gene Hackman, Sean Young, Will Patton, no way out. Oh, Pascal, this brings back so many memories. I remember watching this film many times back in the late 80s when I was um, when I was a teenager, I, just leaving school and going to university. It's such a great film, but it's your, your uh, leading on this. What are your memories of No Way Out? Uh, I mean, they're, they're twofold. And, and to your point, these were different times. I mean, can I just say, uh, I mean, 1980s and 90s trailers were amazing. You know, the voice and yes. everything else, <laughs> uh, you know, which is kind of absolutely fascinating. And it, it, the way they just drags you in, because as we'll see in a moment, you know, in terms of options, they were limited. You know, they, the internet wasn't around at all. I mean, bar maybe in the military and and um, institutions like universities and so on. And my memory is this is a movie that um, I used to work in a video store, a rental video store in the early 90s, which is where my passion comes from. And this was on the shelf alongside all the other Kevin Costner movies of the time, you know, from The Untouchable to Bull Durham to, uh, to all these. And No Way Out was rented over and over again. And again, different times, because No Way Out was also a movie that would be at the cinema on a regular basis. I mean, particularly, as you'll see in a moment, once you, you won a, a few awards, it was re-released at the screening. You wouldn't do that nowadays. A movie gets its release, you know, very quickly moves on to Blu-ray DVDs and online. And then never to be seen again yeah. by the fan who bought the um, the Blu-ray and those who can pay the rental uh, online. Different times altogether. And for me, it was all about the most um, edge of the seat thriller, where you cared so much about the characters and hated the characters you needed to hate as well, <laughs> with, with just as much in you know, a kind of um, energy. And we okay. won't mention what the twist is at the end for those who. I have not seen No Way Out, I don't know if people like this exist, but <laughs> a twist at the end that is delivered in such a way that I was completely gobsmacked. And then what you want to do is watch No Way Out again to see if you can pick up any signals that would lead you to understand what what, what, what the twist is. So, yeah, No Way Out. Um, I regrettably, I don't have the, uh, the Blu-ray, but something I could watch happily once a year. We re watched it again recently, a few few nights after we did the recording with, with Kate for episode 100, <laughs> and all those memories came flooding back. I mean, it probably is over 20 years since we saw it, but yeah, I mean, even though there's, there's no real technology, it was before mobile phones, it was just as the internet was starting, um, there's an interesting scene where they're trying to reconstruct a very, very poor yes. image of a photograph, which you think it took 
took them days and days in the um, in the film, and it added to the tension because he knew that his face was going to be revealed as this technique was going. But of course, nowadays we just bung it into Photoshop and we'd have it straight away, wouldn't we? It's quite interesting. But yeah, edge of the seat stuff and great performances from Kevin Costner and Sean Young and Gene Hackman and and Will Patton. Completely, there, there is not one character, even all the supporting characters, which is um, where we will talk about that, the, the marketing and the missed opportunities. There is not one character that is superfluous to the story, mm. and we're in, the, in this crazy situation where our hero is essentially about to become the number one suspect of a murder that was committed by somebody else altogether that is all powerful and, and for me there was also this movie which is about you know the corridors of power and corruption and how um someone played by Jim hackman has support from aides who are prepared to lie cheat and whatever yeah. uh, this would never happen in real life of course roger of course not <laughs> no of course not it does it always it seems to be a daily occurrence in westminster these days doesn't it <laughs> So in terms of the, um, the, the marketing, because the, the, it's tricky, isn't it? We can't talk about the movie too much without giving too much away. No, no. But, um, I mean, interestingly, you saw it recently. It, this was made in, nine, well, released in 1987, uh, different times again, about how releases were taking a lot longer. So August 87 was the US, so massive summer blockbusters. December was actually, that year was in France. And the UK had to wait till January 1988 to be able to see the movie. So this very long, long release, which allows, of course, for a lot more PR might yes. because you knew you have the, the feedback and so on. So expect there was tons of TV interviews, radio and and press. But of course, we, we saw the trailer a, a moment ago and we could study that. But I wanted to spend some time on two elements, the posters mm. to begin with and the lobby cards, essentially the social media of its time, and the press photos, because this is what we had access to primarily were static images. So <clears throat> if you think about the, the, the poster, people can go online and research it because interestingly, there was only one version of the poster. You know, currently people do three, four different versions for different uh, platforms and different audiences. There was just this one, which is almost this, this kind of um, effects of torn pages of, of a magazine or a paper with layers. And so we have obviously, um, you know, our two lead, um, Sean Young and Kevin Costner as, as lovers. Then you've got this very sinister looking Jim Hackman above. And then we have the, the repeat of the, the character by Kevin Costner running away yes. from danger. And so, so we think, and then no way out the, the credits and then the strap line, is it a crime of passion or an act of treason? And there is so much, um, kind of something about it they're so enigmatic you don't really understand what it is all about until you go and see the movie no and it is a very simple poster and yet a very detailed and 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 if an effective poster as well isn't it all the different aspects of the film are encapsulated in those images and i just love that sort of contrast between the color image of them as, as lovers and the black and white almost slightly pixelated um images of gene hackman and and kevin costner running yeah and and again back to this idea of you need to look back to to, to know where we are going i know that people on social media will talk about photo montage and in mm -hmm. a way sometimes that forgive me it sounds as though they've invented it and and yeah. this was the case already with posters and later on vhs and and, and dvd covers and i mean what is interesting for me about the choice that they've made you are it's it, it's very simple and one could almost say it doesn't feel like they put a lot of work into it, but it's back to the idea of its um, you know, heritage. And this is a novel. This began as a book mm -hmm. that people could read. In fact, there was an um, earlier version. There was even a French uh, version of, of the movie. So I think for me, I wonder if there's a nod to the heritage of starting as a print material <laughs> and content before becoming, becoming a movie. Uh, talking of print, so... Lobby cards. So for people of our age, and maybe a fraction younger, um, uh, Roger, 
going to the movies was an experience. I mean, this is less so now. It's more like um, going through, you know, an airport. Yes. <laughs> going to the movies, you know. But, you know, this idea of going to the ticket desk, buying the ticket, and then walking down the corridors and admiring the posters and the lobby cards of the time, whereby you could be tempted to either stick around to watch something else afterwards or come back the following week. Um I am a lobby card collector, um, I listen to add. So I love going to kind of uh, car boot sales and whatever, because this is how you can find a lot of them. Now, back in the days, lobby cards were sent to cinemas to show in, in the corridors and behind uh, kind of glass panels in sets of eight. And as good luck would have it, lots of historians out there have kind of put together um, a copy of what those eights are. And out of the eight, so why eight? Because the, the size meant that you could have two side by side times four, you have your eight. And that was uh, that was a size of a typical poster as well. So it would fit yeah. in, guaranteed to fit in within you know, the cinemas on kind of display units and so on. And out of the four, you've got four images in color of the relationship between Sean Young and you know Kevin Costner as lovers. And four with that conflict within the, the corridors and offices mm. of government, uh, which I think is is a fair representation in a static image way of what the movie is about. Yeah, no, they, that, that's interesting. I mean, they just don't do lobby cards anymore, or do they? Well, the version would be, you know, they do early releases of still images on yes. Twitter and Facebook, but I'm sorry, and this is me being very nostalgic and romantic about those things, <laughs> but they don't, they just don't have the appeal of, I want to own one of those and I want to frame it and put no. it in my uh, office studio. It's just more disposable digital, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I do like the press photos that you've come up with here that and the the black and white, obviously, but they, they're crisp and they, again, they're, they're action shots look absolutely fabulous and again draw you into the narrative and what is interesting uh because you have two audiences so lobby cards is for the uh, movie going public and of course as you mentioned the press photos and again we're so lucky to have historians on the web who was able to find photos from photographer called Gemma Lamana Wills mm. who was one of the early female photographers to work on Hollywood studios. And she got a big break thanks to none other than Clint Eastwood uh -huh. and um, was able to then, and if you go on the official official website, there's some selling things. But what is interesting to your point, yeah, the, the press photos are in black and white. Why? Because of course, magazines and newspapers back then, we used to print things in black and white a lot cheaper. But also what I thought was interesting, if you compare the press photos with the, um, lobby cards, the press photos make it much, much clearer that we're going to have a massive, massive physical clash and conflict between Kevin Costner and Will Patton's characters. And I find it fascinating that they kept that away from the from the public facing lobby cards. What do you make of that? Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, it's almost layering layering what we're what we're talking about, and also there's the reveals as well. Um, I, I guess uh, one of the problems we have these days is that sometimes the trailers effectively blow the plot, don't they? Or they or they show you all the best bits straight away. Uh, maybe they didn't do that as much in the past, but again, the, the different layering of the photographs and the and the um, lobby mm. cards certainly creates that different term um, perspective. And I think that meant that as an experience, as a, as a marketing technique, you would have. Um, the lobby card, you know, forgive me, experience. But then if you were to pick up the local newspapers or magazines or, or kind of entertainment uh, print, you would see something very different. So you avoid duplication. And you could almost play the game of, you know, being the, investigating more <laughs> about, about the movie. Um, to, to your point about the trailers, there was obviously, as we'd expect, a um, anniversary re-release of the movie. And as is often the case, what people do is they recut the trailer. And so I watched the 35th anniversary trailer, um, a 30th anniversary trailer, should I say, and I was left nonplussed. And, oh. and I had to be careful. I'm thinking, is it because I just love the 80s more than, you know, whatever? It, it was very polished. It was very, very well cut. But to your point, it didn't match the tone of, of the movie. It was almost selling a experience that wasn't true to the to the actual uh, to the actual thing. Um, as we continue to talk about the, the marketing, then with marketing you have to make decisions, Roger. And one decision was how do you position this movie yes. when it's all said and done. 
And interestingly, again, uh, for all this was made in 1987, we're so lucky there is so much information and so, so many reviews and podcasts about this movie that is really, really well loved. I discovered that there's been some sh photos that were created whereby on one hand you have Kevin Costner in full kind of uh, officer's uniform and Sean Young in a kind of, you know, uh, incredible golden dress she wears at one of the um, ball and galas. But there's also a series of photos where they are both literally topless. Mm -hmm. Sean Young has her back turned to, to, away from the camera, but she's suddenly, and both of them are, are hugging, um, pretty much, you know, uh, essentially nude. And these were, were never used, but they were shot. And I wonder whether there was a time for the marketing and the distributors where they went, which way do we go? Do we go officers and a gentleman and do we go political thriller or do we go nine and a half weeks? You know, which way do we go to tempt the audience? And, and, and happily, they've gone for the thriller and conspiracy and didn't use or hardly use those kind of, um, you know, topless shots. I mean, it's very fascinating, isn't it? I mean, yeah, could they have positioned it as a, an erotic movie? I mean, obviously, there is that mm -hmm. scene. There is that scene in the back of the car after the party where they effectively start uh, disrobing and then they get it on, don't they, in the back of this car. And let's face it, I admitted before, I was a teenage bloke coming at, coming out of school just thinking about university. I'm pretty sure that when my friends and I watched this, that scene got watched more than the film did. We probably rewound it a few times. It was a, actually quite an erotic um, scene, and it still is. However, it's integral to the plot. And it had to happen like that because of the way the film turns out. I don't think this would have worked as an erotic thriller because after that scene, the story then became the, mm. the political thriller that it became. And if they'd effectively shoehorned more sex into it or more nudity later, I think that would have been to the detriment of the film. But the scene in the car itself was necessary. I think so because if you don't believe that you know the characters um, of played by Kevin Costner and Sean Young are truly in love, and they want to find a way to extract themselves from the grip of you know um, essentially a um, the menace of Gene Hackman's character, but also yeah. simply the world that they live in, then the rest doesn't doesn't kind of work because all we have then is Kevin Costner trying to find ways to hide the fact that he knew this woman, you know, once she was obviously um, murdered. And I, I don't think also the twist at the end would work so dramatically where mm -hmm. I was left completely dumbfounded having, you know, seen the evolution of, of the character. But to your point, I was able to find, um, as we'd expect, some reviews and comments. And there's one from a, a pop culture historian called uh, Ed Holtz, who did write a review for Barnes & Noble. And he writes about the No Way Out generating a lot of buzz because of the steamy seduction scene grappling into the back of the limo. But it is a nail-biting suspense, subsequently generated by a stone thriller that keeps fans coming back to the movie years later over and over again. I think that's a wonderful summary yes. of what you've just said, because, and that was already the view in 1987, and it's never changed ever since. No, absolutely right. And and when we rewatched it the other day, I think it still fits together perfectly. And I'm glad they didn't go down the, the route of forcing more eroticism into it. Absolutely. So um, having done the research, I now need to find a Blu-ray copy to watch this again. <laughs> uh, I will not obviously be as enamored with the uh, the more recent trailer than, than the older one. Um, but for me, it's interesting because this was a movie that's, that was prompted because of our conversation about Will Patton. Mm -hmm. And if I had to have one criticism, and this is only one criticism from the comfort of my armchair, I wasn't around in 1987. I didn't know about, you know, restrictions and and what where you could do but will Patton, for example as a character and many others they are so important in the movie and they are they're so incredibly good and they didn't get the the, the coverage now, granted i don't think you can match you know um kevin costner jim hackman and shun young from the profiling point of view but I think there was still an opportunity to talk more about the other characters, even about the music from Maurice Jarre that actually mm. got the award and so on. So I wonder whether there was there's a lesson in there about making sure you f make full use of your assets and the key messages of your content, whether that's a movie or a recent article. No, I think you're absolutely right. And, and maybe in the past there was always that focus on one or two big stars. 
Um, I mean, let's face it, Gene Hackman was pretty huge in those days, and yet the film did focus mainly on Kevin Costner and, and Sean Young as the leads. So, mm. yeah, it's always worth and uh, looking at those inc- so the, those um, secondary characters and support actors, because as you say, Will Patton in this film is absolutely superb. Well, I really enjoyed watching <laughs> No Way Out again. I really enjoyed talking about it, and as always, you know, quite surprised by how much material you've managed to dig up. You know, some of those photographs are absolutely remarkable. And thanks to the internet, we're, we're able to talk about them and to share them. Everyone, thank you so much for watching or listening to episode 101 of Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. If you have any questions about the show, if you have any suggestions about the films that you'd like us to review or the tech and the marketing software and and gizmos that you'd like us to have a look at, please do get in touch and we will have a look at your suggestions. I think all that's left to say is thank you again for watching and we'll see you on the next show. And in the meantime, get out there and make sure that your marketing is done right. I was Roger Edwards and he was Pascal Fintoni.